Welcome to the Jaron Jarvis channel. I am Jaron Jarvis. Today, I would like to introduce to you, my ex-boyfriend visited Japan's suicide forest. He came back different. Part 1. A phone call from Gina in the middle of the night was unexpected, to say the least. A phone call from Gina telling me that Eli had disappeared and that she needed my help. Well, I was so confused I could barely process the words she was speaking. Whoa, Gina, slow down. I sat up in bed, my head still foggy with sleep, and rubbed my eyes. What do you mean, he ran away? Exactly what it sounds like, Mora. I woke up and he was gone. He didn't take his keys or wallet, but he left the front door wide open. I thought about calling the police, but they'd probably just blow me off, since Eli's a grown man and clearly left of his own volition. Please, Mora. Gina's voice broke like a wave against a rocky shore. I'm really worried about him. I agreed with Mora, this was odd behavior, even for Eli. However, I still had no idea why Gina had called me of all people, or what exactly she expected me to do. Yes, Eli and I had remained good friends after our breakup, but it wasn't as if I knew the man inside and out. Besides, Gina didn't even like me that much, and the feeling was mutual. He's been acting weird ever since he got back from Japan, she went on and when was that, exactly? About a week ago. Haven't you seen all the photos he posted on Facebook? I had indeed, and as far as I could tell, nothing about them seemed off. If anything, Eli appeared to be having the time of his life. Being Japanese-Canadian on his mother's side, he had always dreamed of visiting the country of his ancestors, and was overjoyed when the opportunity to do just that finally presented itself. Maybe he was still adjusting to being back in small-town Ontario after half a month in Tokyo. But that didn't explain him taking off in the middle of the night, something must have happened to him over there, but he won't tell me. Even over the poor phone connection, Gina's distress was palpable, and as much as she irritated me, I began to feel bad for her. Gina, I'm sorry, but I really don't know what to tell you. Why don't you just wait and see what happens? If he hasn't shown up by morning, call around and ask if anyone's seen him. Or call the police. Maybe I should go out and look for him. No, stay where you are. You'll want to be there if he comes back which I'm sure he will. Okay. Gina still sounded uncertain, but a little calmer. Maybe I'm overreacting. Normally, I'd be inclined to agree with her. This time, however, I couldn't ignore the growing ball of unease in my chest. Gina and I hung up. And although I was exhausted, it took me a long time to fall back asleep. I didn't hear from Gina the following day, but I did hear from Eli. He called my cell phone just as I entered my apartment after work. Mora, hey. He sounded cheerful, and the anxiety that had been gnawing at me all day dissipated a little. I'm sorry if Gina worried you. Eli. What happened last night? I went for a walk. No big deal. You left the door wide open. And you didn't take anything with you. That's kind of weird, Eli. Well, I'm back now, and I'm okay. So everything's okay, isn't it, Mora? Where did you go? Nowhere important, he said, a little too sharply mind if I swing by? I blurted. I need to see you. Why I said that, I do not know. Maybe, deep down, I already knew that something was terribly wrong. A long pause. Then, sure, why not? I drove over to Eli's apartment building and rode the creaky old elevator up to the third floor. Eli answered before I had a chance to knock. Mora. Hey. He grinned and gave me a quick hug. I returned the embrace, then stepped back and studied him for a moment. I hadn't seen him since before he left for Japan, and he looked pretty much the same. Well, his dark brown hair was a little longer than normal, but nothing significant had changed. That said, there was still something off about him, and I didn't know what to make of it. Why don't you come in? I want to show you something. Um. Sure. I followed Eli inside, declined his offer of a beer, and watched him crack open a can for himself and guzzle at least half of it in a single gulp. Living room, he said. Come on. The coffee table was littered with crumpled balls of paper. 
in the middle sat a thick book with a glossy black cover. That, Eli told me, is my sketchbook. Sketchbook? Since when are you into art? Eli ignored me, sitting down on the couch and motioning for me to join him. I keep drawing her, but I'm still getting the hang of it. The problem is, her form is kind of hard to perfect. Who are you talking about? He looked at me like it should have been obvious. Her? The girl I met in Aokigahara. Propping open the sketchbook, he flipped through the pages for a minute, then passed it to me. What do you think? I looked down at the drawing, and my heart sank like a dead body tied to cinder blocks and tossed into the ocean. Staring back at me was the portrait of a woman, done in charcoal pencil. She had shoulder-length black hair, and her head canted sharply to the right, in a way that looked painful and unnatural, a grimacing mouth revealed crooked teeth. There was a look of desperation in her eyes, a silent plea for help her name is Yumeko, Eli explained, as casually as if he were talking about a friend he met over coffee. She's one of them. One of who, Eli, you're starting to scare me. One of the people who hide in Aokigahara, said Eli, completely ignoring the latter half of my sentence. I camped out there one night. Woke up to the sound of a woman crying and went to investigate. Found you Mecco in the trees. As he spoke, I had been probing my memory, wondering where I had heard Aokigahara before. It sounded familiar, but the meaning eluded me. Until Eli mentioned the trees. A light dawned, and my body went cold. You don't mean yes, I do. Eli was looking right at me, but his bottle green eyes were vacant, seeing nothing. The Suicide Forest. 